Let's get it. This is Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Listeners, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients. And uh, we have a professor getting ready to take us to school. I know I've said this before of get your notebook out, but we are going to cover some incredible and important information today. And Pasho, it's March, baby, but we's on Stanford's campus. Not really, but our, our guest is. And uh, so we're season two, episode 21, Dr. Anna Lemke coming from Stanford University, which is Palo Alto, California. Uh, and first of all, where you can find her, Dr. Lemke, via her website, AnnaLemke.com. And I'm going to spell her last name, L-E-M-B-K-E, and then dot com. So welcome, uh, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's how we do it on Life Essential. That is a very strong, great humble, start. Great start. start. That's how we do it. Okay. We're getting warmed up. Here we go. I'm going to introduce our guest. Dr. Lemke is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. A clinician scholar, she has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and commentaries. She sits on the board of several state and national addiction-focused organizations, has testified before various committees in the United States House of Representatives and Senate, keeps an active speaking calendar, and maintains a thriving clinical practice. In 2016, she published Drug Dealer MD, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients got hooked and why it's so hard to stop. Drug Dealer was highlighted in the New York Times as one of the top five books to read to gain an understanding on the opioid epidemic. Dr. Lemke recently appeared on the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, an unvarnished look at the impact of the social media on our lives. Her most recent book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence, was an instant New York Times bestseller, explores how to moderate compulsive overconsumption in the dopamine overloaded world. Dr. Lemke has received at least 28 honors. I'm sure there was more, but I, that's what I found in doing my research uh, and awards in her career. And I am certain more are on the way. Dr. Lemke, here we go again. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. So we always start. I know you're a first time listener and that's going to change after this episode because this is you're on all kind of TV shows, podcasts. I'm guaranteeing this is the most fun and your heart is going to be full after this episode. So uh, we always start life's essential ingredients with a thought of the day. I changed up this quote this morning, even though I prepped on you a few days ago and I uh, from reading your book, I took one of yours. Uh, and uh, so I just want to ask you, why would I pick this one? So here's the quote. It is not our perfection, but our willingness to work together to remedy our mistakes that creates the intimacy we crave. Mm. And that's from the amazing Donner, uh, Dr. Anna Lemke. Why well, pick that out of uh, millions of quotes that I can have? Well, I think you really it sounds like you want to emphasize to your listeners how to build intimacy and community. And we often think that by kind of talking about our accomplishments and accolades, we'll get people to draw near. But in fact, what really brings people close is when we talk about the ways that we're damaged, flawed, selfish, have made mistakes. Um, that's what people really want to hear because it makes them feel not so alone in their own brokenness. Um, and it creates a kind of a profound intimacy where we then shore each other up and hold each other in times that are hard. Mm -hmm. Mm, we're already going there uh, <laughs> but it's going to be deep and I, I just yeah I'm, I'm taking notes the whole time um, but I love everything that you said but not alone in our brokenness and and that's a a word that I'll use uh, often and I think it's there's a little bit of controversy because I think people take offense to 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 being broken and mm. you're not aware but 
I've been a, a registered nurse is what I've done is my profession for 29 years. And so I know what happens when the body gets broken in and it, it, it heals stronger. And I'm sure you're mm. familiar with Kent Sugi. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, so many incredible things with that. And uh, I think it's going to be an incredible episode uh, right out of the gate. So I want to get in to having some intimacy uh, with us three and our and our listeners. But I think we do that by letting people know a little bit about who you are. And obviously you take this any which way you want to go, but what was life like growing up? Wow. Okay. So um, um, my parents were immigrants and we moved around a lot and I was very fortunate, you know, to have parents who, um, you know, made sure that we had everything we needed and we were basically kept safe and, um, I had a wonderful older brother and two younger sisters and so lucky in a lot of ways, but um, unlucky in some other ways in the sense that my parents had a very troubled marriage. Um, being immigrants, we didn't have, you know, a network of relatives to go to because we moved around a lot. It was difficult to make friends or build community outside the family. And so there was this kind of having to rely on a family that really didn't function all that well. Um so, you know, naturally that has a huge influence. We're all so deeply influenced by our early childhood experiences and the early coping strategies that we learn and, um, and then have to unlearn to some extent as adults. Um, but that, that's sort of my story. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Lemke, um, it's interesting you say that I'm also a child of immigrant uh, parents, but I live in San Pedro, California. And they came here and I'm Croatian and there was a community of Croatians. So I had friends that were kind of experienced the same thing that I was going through, mm. which is, you know, our families are a little different than your typical families we found here, but we bonded like that. And I can't imagine if I didn't have that support, like you did moving around, uh, how difficult that must have been for you and how that shaped you. Well, thank you for your empathy. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, you know, many people have had it much, much harder, but that that was very difficult. Um, and when my family finally sort of settled down and I was able to be in one place long enough to make friends, those are friends I've kept my whole life. And as a parent myself, one pledge I made to myself and my kids was that I wouldn't move them around. Let me just say there are there are ways to move around as a family, which can be wonderful. Um, but my experience wasn't positive. And so I wanted to make sure that my parent, my kids kind of grew up in the same place and could have, you know, community uh, in our neighborhood with their friends at school and that kind of consistency, which I think is, is important for kids. You know, we have to create that kind of consistent structure. Mm. So I know in, in prepping for you, um, you mentioned your children in, in another episode that I was listening to. Uh, and uh, I think they were asking you about your career and your highlights and what are you most proud of? And you were so humble and dancing around that because you've had an amazing career and, and have done uh, such and continue to do incredible work. But you you mentioned you were most proud of your children and uh, it just made my heart beat a little bit faster. Um, and then now just in the short time of getting to know you and then in hearing your story of knowing that your childhood wasn't uh, 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 a Disneyland, you know, a, <laughs> you know, experience. It wasn't the happiest place mm. on earth. So I want to get back. I'm going to come back to that statement. But so you mentioned you were most proud of your children. What what did you mean specifically, you know, by that? Oh, I mean, I think first and foremost, I'm just grateful that they exist and that they're alive, you know, um, that I have the opportunity to be a mother um, and to share that that experience with my husband, share the experience of raising them. Um, early on, I heard a phrase from somewhere that children are borrowed from God. And I really like um, that way of thinking about it, that we do have, you know, a huge impact on our children, but there's also ways in which we can only do what we can do. And they're sort of, um, you know, also driving under the steam of other forces. And so uh, just really trying to be grateful for the opportunity to be a parent, um, which they've given me um, and 
also just to try to keep things in perspective, you know, we're here in Silicon Valley. This is a very high achieving place, a very competitive academic environment all the way down to kindergarten. So just really trying to be mindful myself and with them about, you know, what life really is all about, what really matters. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, it's not the grades you get, it's the effort that you put in. My kids always challenge me on this. They say, mom, you know, if, if we didn't get A's, you, you wouldn't be happy. I said, and I really mean, that's not true. What I wouldn't be happy with is if they, um, you know, didn't try. If my kids got C's, but were giving in their best effort, that would be absolutely okay with me. Um, and I think they, they know that that's true. Yeah. How do you quick tip to, to any parents that are listening? Cause I do think uh, we've gotten so competitive in, and I raised my kids in Davis. So UC Davis, not quite the academic institution that Stanford is, but pretty close up there. And all oh, yeah. my neighbors, all my neighbors were physicists and chemists and world renowned, you know, speakers like yourself. And, and I think it was four fifths of, of my daughter's eighth grade class. You know, you're at the graduation. Hey, stand up. If you had a 4.0 GPA, mm. you know, and four fifths of the kids are up, you know, my right. kids are not in, and they were, uh, fall fell kind of in the category of, Hey, learn to work hard and do the best that you can. Right. Uh, and if that's a, a, B or C, then, then that's great. But what tip would you give to parents who think that it is, you know, about getting the A and perhaps pushing the kids too hard too early. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a walker and uh, I was walking early this morning and my neighbor, uh, Peyton, cute little girl, uh, uh, in, uh, kindergarten and her mom's just talking about how she's already reading everything, which is great. But then you look at Finland, who's one of the, the highest achieving, uh, countries academically and the kids don't even think about anything academically uh, till after they're seven years old, they go to school and they just play and they learn how to get along. And so back to my question, what is the right balance? You know, and I know homeostasis is huge and everything that we're going to talk about uh, today, but let's, let's focus on that question right now. Yeah. So I, first of all, I want, I want to just acknowledge that in our modern culture, which is so narcissistically oriented on, you know, self-achievement and self-aggrandizement, it is really hard to keep the balance. And as parents, you know, we're getting signals from many different sources, encouraging us to be competitive and to be competitive through our children. And that comes through the sports, sports and coaching that comes through the academics. You know, the simple fact that at your daughter's graduation, they asked that question. I mean, is, you know, that's disturbing, right? That they singled out the kids who had, you know, higher grades and shamed the ones who didn't in a very public manner. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that that is the world that we live in. And then as parents to try to be really intentional and mindful about pushing back against that culture in our own families. And the way to do that really is just to continually come back to what really is important. And what really is important is love in the family, the, the family connection, um, being truthful, you know, being honest, telling the truth and other important morals and values um, that, that I think, you know, we don't give enough um, sort of attention in the modern world, um, how to be a good citizen, you know, in the home and outside the home. So, so basically trying to emphasize ways of achieving that are not related to grades or money or external accomplishments, but are really these intrinsically oriented ways of becoming better people and becoming better citizens and enhancing, you know, intimacy uh, in the family and in friendships and doing good in the world. Man, and I love... Yeah, we're speaking the same language in a lot of things because, yeah, the word brokenness and then intimacy. And maybe it's just, you know, when you're a nurse, you're given such um, a responsibility. But I think just the most beautiful opportunity to be to sit with people 
most of the time at the worst time of their life and have these intimate moments where you just really get to focus on what's truly essential, which is why I named this show Life's Essential Ingredients. Because I've been surrounded by death. And when you live in that space and you see that uh, every day going to work, you want to kind of hurry up and get into that space and help people realize the sooner we get there, the happier we're going to be, whatever that is for you. Um, and so, yeah, I love uh, I love you, Sharon. I want to take one step back and I'm I'm sorry. I took so many notes. I probably got 30 pages of notes from your book. <laughs> you were talking you talk because I'm a learner. I just I just love to learn. And in your book great. and, great. and, I, and I, I'm not a great note taker, <laughs> but that, so I could be dead wrong on what I'm gonna say here because you're talking about <laughs> truthful, but I think you learned that lesson early on in your life. And so I have a note here that I said Anna's story of the Easter bunny and not being truthful about yeah. eating chocolate and then i have an arrow going up used for podcast <laughs> am i smoking stuff or can we is that a good little segue to what you're trying to share here yeah no that's absolutely well first of all let me let me just say that i grew up in a family first of all let me say that that the average adult tells one to two lies per day um that we all tend to lie it's our natural default you know, it's not necessarily big things or, or sort of life-threatening lies, just little lies that cover up our selfishness and the, our irresponsibility. Um, and I also grew up in a family in which sort of lying was quite normative. There was a, a lot of lying going on. So my, you know, first couple decades of my life, I was really kind of inculcated in, you know, lying as, as being sort of normative. I'm not, again, talking about for the most part, horrific lies or lies that would hurt people, but just the lies that we tell to cover up the ways in which we've done wrong. And one of the things that I've learned from my patients is the um, importance of truth-telling to a life well-lived. And I have a chapter called Radical Honesty, where I detail um, what radical honesty is. It's telling the truth about everything, large and small, and how effortful it is, how it um, actually requires us to pay attention and stimulate our prefrontal cortex um, and really wake up you know, to our lives and um, how doing that can help us manage the problem of addiction and compulsive overconsumption. And I then share an anecdote um, where um, I told a lie in my family. I had um, eaten some of my kids' Easter bunny chocolate and I sort of thought I was just like nibbling a tiny little bit every day, but after about a week, they were mostly gone and I had eaten them because my kids were little and sort of forgot, forgot about them. But then like about a week into it, you know, my kids were like, Hey, yeah, where's my Easter bunny chocolate? And they pulled their Easter, Easter bunnies down. And they're like, what the, what happened? Like who ate my, my chocolate? And I lied. I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> And, and they were like, did you eat my chocolate? I said, no, no, I wouldn't do that. I didn't eat your chocolate. And then they're just like, well, who did, who did it became this great mystery. And they kept saying to me like for the day after that, did you, who, who ate my chocolate? Did dad eat the chocolate? No, he denied it. And then they started to turn on each other and started to accuse each other of eating the chocolate. And then I was like, oh man, I need to come clean. Like I need to tell them that I ate the chocolate. It was amazing how hard it was. I mean, a grown woman discussing Easter bunny chocolate with six-year-olds. And yet I really had a hard time doing it. So the shame, you know, that I, but I had to say, you know, I'm so sorry, but I, I did eat your chocolate. And they're like, and you lied about it. It's like, yes. And I also lied about it. I'm really sorry. So the point is that like, we're all so fallible, right? We're such complex beings and we do these crazy things, but we can make amends, right? We can come clean. We can make up for them. We can repair the damage. And it's so important that we do that because otherwise this vicious cycle of lying leads to really bad places. Mm -hmm. And that's, and let me just jump to that. And that's a, such a great story. And as you were telling, it's so cool because I remember reading that, but didn't write down all the details and then to listen to you uh, share that pretty cool uh, for me to just go back to that space, but can make amends. 
you know, the older I get, the, the more I realize that the value in, in each and every word that comes out of our mouth. But in order to make amends, I have to have the self-awareness to realize that I've been in this space that hasn't been honest. And I think it's getting harder and harder to get into that space because our minds are just so distracted that I don't even think we're aware. And it's just in listening to that story, I'm going and I'm sorry if I use this word in the wrong context, but a lot of times alcoholics will confabulate just because it just becomes what they do. And it kind of, uh, I don't get worried, but I feel like sometimes we can get into that space as a society of it just becomes the norm, that one to two that you mentioned of kind of uh, sort of telling an untruth can quickly lead to, hey, that's just how we've structured uh, our day. And so my question is, how would you help? What would be a step if you're working with one of your clients and you just get the sense that they have zero self-awareness? Uh, that they are in this space of not telling the truth. What would be the first one or two steps to help someone uh, increase their self-awareness? Well, I mean, you know, there are many different methods for increasing self-awareness. What I do is I just kind of normalize lying as a symptom of the disease of addiction. I just say, you know, when people are in their addiction, they can't see true cause and effect because they're chasing dopamine. Um, and they get into what one of my patients called the lying habit, where it's not just that they're lying about their consumption of their drug of choice, they're lying about everything and anything just because they're in the lying habit. I had a patient who said when he was in his addiction, if he was at Burger King and a friend called and said, hey, where you are? He said, yeah, I'm at McDonald's. And if he was at McDonald's and the friend called, he'd say, yeah, I'm at Burger King. I mean, it didn't even make any sense, right? It was just sort of lying became sort of part of part of the game, sort of part of the disease, really. Um, and I've learned from my patients that one step they can take, even before they you know, stop using their drug of choice, is to engage in radical truth telling where they try to go through a whole day and not tell a single lie. And just the simple fact of monitoring themselves in that way can be a really good way of alerting themselves to how much they are lying because they don't even realize it. As you say, it's just sort of become um, what they do. So prescribing radical truth telling is, is something that I do. I like that. I like that prescribing too. Uh, very cool. So let's get in a little bit to, you have so many different expertises, but uh, yeah, vulnerable to the problem of addiction. And I'm just reading some some stuff. We have so many new addictive medications, and I love how you uh, throw this out there, including cell phones, gaming, internet. Um, and uh, this is from another article, uh, you, and it's saying she calls a smartphone the modern day hypodermic needle. Uh, we turn to it for quick hits, seeking attention, validation, and distraction with each swipe, like, and tweet. Since the turn of the millennium, behavioral as opposed to substance addictions have soared. Every spare second is an opportunity to be stimulated, whether by entering the TikTok vortex, scrolling on Instagram, swiping through Tinder, or binging on porn, online gambling, and e-shopping. So let's, let's get into that from, from the mindset or the, just the brain of youth and why this is such a, a, an important um I'll say battle to address and, and um, yeah, I'll just, I'll be quiet and let you speak to, to that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's a critical window between about age three and about age 25 um, when our brain goes through something called the pruning process. So we're born with more neurons than we need and then, we'll, and then we'll ever use. And from about age five to about age 20, what our brain is doing is cutting away the neurons that we don't use and myelinating the neurons that we use most often. And myelin is a protective uh, sheath that goes on the neurons to uh, make them more efficient. So that means that the behaviors that we practice and do routinely in our childhood and adolescence creates the scaffolding that we will be left with as adulthoods. 
as adults, which, which, which is why it's so important, um, you know, that we have a good foundation early on. And of course, what's happened now is that, um, you know, more and more young people are online, um, unsupervised, um, being exposed to all kinds of reinforcing um, online content um, that's shaping their brains in ways that really, um, I think is a, a really scary, potentially um, irreversible experiment in terms of, you know, what is going to happen uh, to that generation that's been, been weaned on these digital products, especially since we do know that this online content uh, is potentially addictive. It releases dopamine, our pleasure neurotransmitter in the brain's reward pathway, you know, with repeated use. Uh, what happens is the brain tries to compensate for all that dopamine by actually downregulating its own, its own dopamine production and transmission, not just to baseline levels, but actually below baseline. People then get in this dopamine deficit state. And that state is really very similar to being clinically depressed. The universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. So I'm seeing more and more young people come into my clinic seeking help for depression and anxiety, and many of them are spending many hours a day online. 20 years ago, the first thing I might have done was prescribe an antidepressant. Now the first thing that I do is to ask them to abstain from their online activity that's consuming their time and their brain uh, in the hopes that by doing so they can reset dopamine reward pathways. And I'm finding that oftentimes that alone will um, alleviate the symptoms of depression, and anxiety without having to do anything else. Mm. Yeah. And is that, so in your book, I think you talk about the uh, Gedanken experiment. Um, is that uh, the same thing that you're doing or is that something I know it's along the same line, but uh, get in and, and highlight uh, what that is for, for the listener, for perhaps an adult that is listening and struggling, saying, wait a second, I'm, if I'm not having my phone right next to me, I start to get anxious and, and maybe walk them through what, what that is. Yeah, so Gedanken, Gedanken experiment is, is German for a thought experiment. And basically what I, the, the book describes, you know, the problem, the ways in which our primitive wiring for approaching pleasure and pain is mismatched for the modern ecosystem. But the book is also very prescriptive where I recommend what we can do about it, at least at the individual level. And what I recommend comes down to um, a dopamine fast to begin with where we abstain from our drug of choice for 30 days. Why 30 days? Because 30 days is usually about the minimum or average amount of time it takes to reset reward pathways. That is to um, get our brain back online and making its own dopamine and bring those levels back to level, uh, you know, healthier levels so that um, we can enjoy other things in our lives and aren't just fixated, narrowly focused on our drug of choice. Um, after 30 days of abstinence, um, then it's a question of, do we want to continue to abstain or do we want to go back to using in moderation? Most people want to go back to using their drug of choice, whether it's a video game or a social media app or cannabis or alcohol, they want to go back to using in moderation. So then we talk about self-binding strategies and what moderation will look like. And we have to get very granular and detailed about that, when they'll use, how much, who with. Um, what types of their substance, and then talk about you know, how they're going to monitor that. So that's essentially the experiment. And I, I recommend that people do it with their digital devices. If they can't do a month, maybe they can do a week. If they can't do a week, maybe they can do 24 hours and just be, observe themselves, um, kind of go into withdrawal, because I think we're all so wired in and dialed into these devices, we, we don't even realize um, that we're addicted. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, that's why I was just, yeah, love your book. Uh, just so honored to have you on this show. Um, and my family gets a little bit riled up and I'm sure listeners get a little bit riled up, but every last part of our society is, and this is a wrong statement to say, and it sounds a little naive, but is forcing you to live your life with some sort of device. I mean, it's really challenging to 
go to a grocery store, to go to a restaurant. I mean, every last person uh, in business wants you to use the app and totally remove any kind of human contact. And yeah, part of me is just like, man, why can't we just wake up? But, and I don't even know what the heck I'm saying right here, but I, there's just, <laughs> there's, because it's just, I get frustrated, but it's like, I'm, and I'm, I'm all for technology. I'm all for yeah, it. Right. But we just we we haven't proven that that we can do a good job in living that life with moderation, you know, and uh, and I have no idea what the answer is uh, and why I go back to asking you to give some insight on youth, because I really, really feel strongly that we're just letting them down uh, mm-hmm. and we haven't done enough to highlight the influence that this is doing on their brain and to have their parents or their guardian, whoever it is that is, you know, guiding them on this journey to help them understand the influence. And maybe the research just isn't out there because you, you try and find stuff on youth. Uh, and then it just seems like it's so outdated. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of just rambling, but, um, let's, let's, let's change this up a little bit. Um, uh, in your book, you have this word and I, I pr- mispronounce, uh, Gedanken and it's now I know it's Gedunken. Uh, so, <laughs> or Mises, I don't know if that's how you say that or not, but, uh, yeah. st- studies that show the beneficial effects of administering small to moderate doses of painful stimuli. And Mike has agreed to go through a live example of this. He has a a sharp nail that he's willing to poke himself with uh, a bunch of times. uh, And for you to kind of guide us on the benefits of Mike bleeding a little bit and experiencing uh, painful stimuli. Mike, thank you so much. When did I agree to this again? I can't remember. (laughs) But let's do it. (laughs) Those yeah, yeah. Go, go over the benefit of that because I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, 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 another quick little, um, all the way, not right up here, uh, somehow, uh, Wednesdays and we don't, it's not cold here, but I'm, I'm goofy this way on Wednesdays. It's my cold training day. So I get up, I told you I walk in the mornings, but it hasn't really been that cold, but I'm going to go in just a t-shirt and shorts. Oh, wow. Uh, and yeah. just to experience, uh, and I didn't even know this hormesis. Uh, I was like, wait a second, this, uh, I've been doing this stuff. I took a year of cold showers to appreciate a hot shower yeah. uh, and to allow myself to go somewhere else and, uh, and just also to appreciate, hey, what that coldness feels like. But walk through why it would be beneficial for people to experience um, this. And, and yeah, Mike, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. All right, great. Well, uh, so let's kind of go back to the brain and dopamine, uh, which is our pleasure and reward neurotransmitter. And, you know, when we ingest intoxicants, um, including doing behaviors that are highly reinforcing, essentially what we're doing is we're bypassing the work um, of getting our dopamine. And instead we're ingesting something that immediately releases a lot of dopamine in the reward pathway. And that's, that's an addictive drug, right? Um, it usually addictive drugs mimic um, a, a neurotransmitter or a molecule that we already make in our bodies. So for example, opioids, we make opioids in our bodies. When we ingest an opioid, what we've essentially done is we've bypassed the natural mechanisms of releasing opioids that we make and instead we're just ingesting it. It's binding to our opioid receptors. It's releasing dopamine in the reward pathway. And that's true for any intoxicant. We make our own version of cannabis. We make um, our own version of alcohol in the form of GABA, calming neurotransmitters and opioids. Alcohol works on the opioid system too. So, and our brains were not wired for that, right? They they were wired to work for uh, these kinds of molecules. So what hormesis is, is hormesis is a branch of science that looks at the ways that we can intentionally uh, seek out mild to moderate painful stimuli as a way to get our bodies to start to make and upregulate 
these endogenous feel good hormones and neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, our endo opioid system, our endocannabinoid system. Um, and what, what that branch of science has discovered uh, is that um, by doing that, what we can do is tell our bodies uh, to actually make more of these um, hormones and chemicals and we feel good. So for example, exercise or ice cold water baths, just as two examples, what they do is we expose our bodies to that painful stimulus. The body says, oh boy, injury going on here. I better start making more dopamine. Dopamine gradually increases uh, over the course of the exercise. And then it remains elevated for hours afterwards before go going back down to our baseline level of tonic dopamine firing. Contrast that with an intoxicant where when we ingest an intoxicant like um, alcohol or another drug, or we play something, do something online that's highly reinforcing, Netflix or video games, we get a huge release of dopamine spiking all up at once. And then dopamine plummets pretty quickly afterwards and we're in dopamine free fall where it goes below baseline. And then we're in that state of restless craving, which is what has us clicking on next episode, right? Or, or watching you know, one more YouTube video or playing one more level of the video game uh, because we want to kind of, you know, we want to parachute for that free fall. It feels so terrible. Um, and that has us naturally reaching for more and more and more. If we don't reach for more and more, what happens is we eventually go back up to baseline, but it was a, it's a painful journey, right? Coming out of that dopamine deficit state. And if we continue to try to reach for more and more, we, we eventually kind of reset our hedonic set point. And we're, we're now kind of in this dopamine deficit, chronic depression state. So it's really important to get our dopamine indirectly by doing the work up front. And that's what hormesis is all about. It's for, means it's, it's Greek for to set in motion. And by doing these things that are hard, not just physically hard, also psychologically and cognitively hard, like radical truth telling, going through the whole day and telling the truth is really hard. It's effortful. Um, and that probably, you know, indirectly leads to uh, increased dopamine, um, as well as our ability to kind of manage our compulsive overconsumption. And you said so much right there. And I just keep thinking on the, the nurse side of the, the addiction and then tolerance, you know, of how we've, we're just 24 seven with dopamine coming and we just can't get enough because what got me that dopamine high took maybe 15 minutes before, but now I keep reinforcing it to get that same feeling now i need 30 minutes and then that 30 leads to an hour and then now all of a sudden i'm wait a second i'm not even going to work because i still need that feeling but i need since i've built up this tolerance to it in my brain and why i love hearing you talk about we have it uh, uh endogenous inside us already uh, made within us if we will just do the things that our body is meant to do go out and exercise. And then you keep that high uh, longer than you will if you uh, uh, introduce it artificially through, you know, technology and the phones and, and everything. So I just get so fired up because I, I feel like nobody's listening. You know, I just feel like we we're just in this world where we're uh, just kind of good with it. Uh, but we're just going to we're already paying a severe price for it. But it's just uh, really um, going to come to a head at, at some point. I'm sorry, I'm an optimist, but this stuff really gets me fired up. You know, and then you you know, in your in your book, you know, you mentioned uh, and this was incredible to me. And I'm really anxious to see your enhanced thoughts on it but that leisure hours are projected to be 7.2 per day by 2040 and you were saying that work i think is going to take only like 3.8 hours but leisure time you know again overall and i'm generalizing so much and i'm sorry if i'm getting anybody pissed off that's that's listening but you can see this is something i'm fired up about because i really feel like we're we're missing we're missing it um but so jump in, jump into that, because now all of a sudden we got 7.2 hours and we're jonesing for more and more dopamine and we haven't figured out just how to sit and just be uh, and marinate it out in nature. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling too much. 
you no no it's, it's on that. yeah no i mean yeah so the you know the point there is that um not only do we have increased access to all kinds of reinforcing drugs and behaviors at the touch of a fingertip but we also have more time than ever before in which to pursue those leisure pursuits um, you know, if you look at the average amount of leisure time during the Civil War was about one hour per day. Some people had no leisure time at all, people who lived in slavery. And slowly over time, with technological advances and more and more machines to do more and more of our work, um, we have more and more leisure time. On average, in the United States, the average adult has about four hours of le leisure time per day. So this is not counting sleeping hours, right? This is just waking hours. And by 2040, we're projected to have seven, the average American is projected to have seven to eight leisure hours, uh, leisure hours per day, which means that we will have more time relaxing than we will working shortly. And again, this is the average American. Um, we also have more days because we live longer than ever before, right? So for most of human history, people died if they were lucky uh, at age 30. Um, you know, now we live on average to about age 80. So that means we have many more days in which to figure out what to do with ourselves. We also have more disposable income to spend on leisure goods, including among the poorest of the poor. And the result is that we have more time and more money than ever before. And what are we doing with it? Well, we are spending it on video games and on pornography and on shopping and on eating. And as a result, we are literally titillating ourselves to death. 70% of the world's global deaths are due to diseases caused by modifiable risk factors like inactivity, smoking, and diet. And the increasing rates of depression, anxiety, addiction all over the world are clearly correlated to wealth of nations. The richer the country, paradoxically, the more likely its people are to be depressed, anxious, and addicted. So I think there's clearly, you know, a causation effect here related to our increased access to dopamine, um, our, you know, increased disposable income and time to, to spend on it. Um, and the unfortunate reality that we're not using our increased leisure time and money on the kinds of pursuits that would really make for a flourishing life. Go for it, Pastor Lito. I've got a question, Dr. Lemke. Um, is there a way to achieve balance where you can go on a video game for a little bit? Or it, are, can we balance our life with these things? Yeah, absolutely. The whole message of Dopamine Nation is really about how to moderate, right? So it's not about eliminating desire or pleasure. I mean, desire is what makes us human. We're wired for, you know, to approach pleasure and avoid pain. It's not about living lives of, you know, abject um, sort of miserableness. But in order to achieve balance in this world, we, we do have to be intentional about, number one, um, abstaining at least for a period of time from our drug of choice long enough to reset reward pathways. And then when we do go back to using in moderation, that we really are very intentional about creating these self-binding strategies. That is to say, I'm only going to use it this time. I'm only going to use this product. I'm only going to use with friends. I'm only going to use, you know, when I'm done with X, Y, or Z. And to really recognize that things like these digital products, they're the equivalent of chocolate cake and ice cream, you know, and you wouldn't have ice cream for breakfast, right? So I think food is a really nice analogy because we've developed certain norms around, you know, appropriate eating, which I think most people generally can agree on. Um, we have to do the same thing with our digital products, like, um, you know, kind of a digital etiquette, what's okay and what's not okay, what's healthy and what's not healthy. The other thing I feel like we need to do, um, and by the way, a lot of people ask, well, can't I just go from, go from where I am to using less rather than stopping it all together and then going back? And in general, I find that doesn't work, um, that we really need to stop for long enough to reset reward pathways so that we kind of cleanse our brains and start over and then go back to using in moderation. Otherwise, we never get to that place where other rewards become interesting again. Um, and when I say, you know, abstain, I'm not talking about abstaining entirely from, 
your phone. That might be something that somebody needs to do if they're really addicted. But in general, it's like abstaining from a particular app that's eating up hours per day or abstaining from a particular video game or abstaining from you know, pornography for a period of time to kind of reset dopamine reward pathways. And then the other thing I recommend is this intentionally inviting healthy pain into our lives. So jabbing your hand with a nail would not be considered healthy pain. Why? Because it's, it's too much pain and it's sort of, you know, to no good end, right? It's just kind of pain, pain for pain's sake. What you want to do is engage in painful activities that are actually healthy. So exercise by every measure uh, increases health, increases lifespan, increases mood, increases dopamine. So that's a, you know, that's a good way to get your dopamine. You don't want to overdo exercise though, either. Um, you know, everything has, you know, in its, in its measure, ice cold water baths, but again, not too cold, right? Not for too long. Um, doing things that are, you know, cognitively challenging, doing things that are emotionally challenging. I have a patient who um, I gave him the homework of ordering his coffee from Starbucks by talking to the barista instead of using the app because he had gotten so socially phobic that he wasn't able to talk to strangers. So that became his challenging activity as a way to kind of upregulate his own feel-good hormones. And after a while with multiple exposures, he was able to do that with ease, right? Which tells you that the brain is plastic and that we can um, exercise it as a muscle and we can get stronger. Um, we just need to in go about that intentionally. And just also to think of pain as not a bad or scary thing, but that is something that can actually be positive and healthy in our lives. And that constantly trying to make ourselves more comfortable is not necessarily a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our culture is focused on this idea that well, if you're in distress, you know, do something that makes yourself feel better. When in fact, really, maybe what you should do is do something that's harder than the distress you're feeling in the moment, which will then change your experience of uh, that initial painful stimulus. Oh, man, again, you're saying too much. And I know we got limited time, but I, I really love, uh, you know, other rewards become interesting again, you know, which is the human touch, which is an engaging conversation, which right. is being out in nature and knowing that our brain is incredible and it has this neuroplasticity to create these connections that are going to give us the dopamine that we need, uh, that is just sitting in our body waiting to be like, come on, let's go. Uh, <laughs> so I just got two more uh, questions for you. Then we're going to let you go. But all these things have been incredible, but, but let's give a little bit of insight on how do you do it? You know, what are some of your life's essential ingredients? Maybe just one. What's the best thing you do for yourself right now as we speak? Oh, well, my main um, sort of wellness practice or sort of ascetic practice, because I do uh, recommend ascetic practices, is I get up early and I walk. So kind of like you, I usually walk about two hours and it's, I don't to plug into anything. So I'm just walking with my own thoughts, which trust me is at times extremely boring and painful. Um, but it's very, very grounding for me because I come, uh, usually by the end of the walk, I'm feeling better. I have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of my ideas usually come out of that walk, but I would say more often than not, um, I experience my conscience during those walks, the things that I need to do and should do um, the, the things that I owe other people. Mm. And I think part of what's so distressing about the way that we're constantly distracting ourselves is that we're, we're actually becoming less moral as a result, right? We're becoming more impulsive. We have, uh, we're, we're kind of becoming antisocial and kind of psychopathic in a way, um, or sociopathic, um, in that if you don't spend time with your own brain, you don't give your conscience an opportunity to speak. And so um, part of my wellness practice is, is largely focused on um, just being quiet. I happen to be walking because I'm restless, but you could do this obviously in a sitting meditation and just seeing you know, what comes up. 
Yeah, I love it. And just real fast, and then the last question for you. My wife and I are going on the Camino de Santiago. Oh, great. I'm jealous. So April uh, 28th, we're on a flight to, to Pamplona, mm-hmm. uh, walking 33 straight days, 500 miles. Uh, I'm going to have a recorder, his only device, because I'm just like <laughs> you. We're similar. I would love to come out and, uh, and walk with you one day and uh, just get in uh, our thoughts. But let's get to the end, not to get morbid. Uh, we're going to fast forward 50 years for you and you've had an incredible life you help uh, people all over the world your clients love you your kids uh, have produced uh, grandkids if that's in the cards and you're just surrounded by love but you're on your deathbed and uh, there's a quote by John Alston the only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind mm-hmm. what is it you want the people that are surrounding you holding your hand sharing their love with you. What is it you want them to feel from the time they had with you? Oh, that's easy for me. I mean, the thing I value above all else is my relationships and human connection and love, you know, that, that I love them and that I, I received their love. That's what we're talking about on life's essential ingredients. What a great episode. Again, we've been with the amazing and talented Dr. Anna Lemke coming from Stanford University, uh, which is in Palo Alto, California. Please check her out, AnnaLemke.com. And again, her last name, L-E-M-B-K-E. Uh, she is the author of the incredible book, uh, Dopamine Nation, uh, Finding Balance in the Age of Endowments. And there it is uh, right there as one of my favorite books. Um, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, Pashito, you got any closing remarks to get us out? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lemke. That was fascinating. And you kind of let me know why I always uh, binge on Netflix now. Now I know what it is. So I got to <laughs> cut that out. And sorry, I've tried the cold showers. I just can't do it. I'm going to work on something else. Though. Thank you. Something else. Everybody's got their, their own particular path. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right. Listeners, you know how we do it. Boom, baby. That just happened. We're out. <laughs>